Welcome to the section, Don't Forget to Save. In this section we continue building the game by giving suggestions about how to script gameplay. In addition, you'll learn how to create and implement a basic save and load system into your game. Before concluding the section, we'll extend the movement component to include jump pads, to add a bit more glamour to your game. We'll start with the first video, Save and Load Systems. In this video, we'll look at why save load systems are important. We'll look at the different types of save load system, and then create one using player prefs. What is a game if it doesn't have a save and load system? It would be a nightmare. Well, for some. It's essential that in games which require you to progress through levels that gradually increase in difficulty, you have an option to save. Unless, of course, you're a masochist and or enjoy putting your players through the perils of permadeath and starting over, then by all means, skip this video. There are different reasons and consequently ways with which you can implement a save option for players. For example, your game may allow a player to save any time and anywhere. Games like Tomb Raider 2 and Abe's Odyssey offer such approaches to saving. Typically, this option is provided via the pause menu, and the player is allocated a set number of slots that they can use to save. Alternatively, you may also have checkpoints that automatically save at specific locations, such as before and or after an important event during gameplay. Games like Army of Two offer this to players. Other options can include specific locations or save points that a player can save, which are like checkpoints, located at specific points that a player will reach within the environment during gameplay. Games like Final Fantasy X offer this. Now let's see how to create a save load system in Unity. There are different ways to save and load your game in Unity. For instance, you can encode your data into a file, and this gives you maximum freedom. In fact, you can allow players to save on your server, encrypt the file and decide exactly how this file is structured. However, for beginners this might not be the easiest approach, since Unity already offers a basic save system called Player Prefs. This system is great because it supports all the platforms, meaning you won't have to change code depending on which platform, computer, Android and more, you're going to ship in. Also, the system is very intuitive. With this said, let's dive into it. Player Prefs, as the name suggests, has been created with the purpose to save and store the player's preferences. In fact, this data is not sensitive, meaning that if the player can change those externally from the game, it's not a big deal. As a result, Player Prefs is very simple, and it works with the key value system. However, often it's used to store game data as well, due to its simplicity and the built-in support in Unity. Although you can extend their functionalities with some plugins that you find in the Asset Store, I suggest using a custom save load system if you're planning to ship the game. Player Prefs is useful to debug functionalities when the save load system is under construction, or just to store your player's preferences. How do they work in practice? You can imagine that each Player Prefs is a pair containing a key which has to be unique across all the Player Prefs, and a value. While the key is always a string, the value can be of different types. In particular, the basic types that Unity supports are integers, decimal numbers, and strings. Here are some examples of possible key value pairs, and in brackets, the type of the value. The next topic is player prefs functions. From a code point of view, there are functions that allow us to interact with the system. They're all within the player prefs class, and they're static functions, so you don't need to instantiate a player pref object. Rather, in your code, type player prefs, followed by the name of the function you want to call. Player prefs dot name of the function. Obviously, the previous function doesn't exist, but it was just an example of a function call. Since these functions are not so many, let's see them all. Void set int. String key int value stores or overrides an integer value type associated with the key. Void set float. String key float value. Stores or overrides a decimal number value type associated with the key. Void set string. String key string value. Stores or overrides a string value type associated with the key. Similar to the preceding three functions, we have three twin functions that instead of storing, retrieve the values based on the key. Keep in mind that if the key doesn't exist, they return the default value of the type. int get int string key. 
retrieves the integer values associated with the key passed as a parameter. Float get float string key retrieves the decimal number value associated with the key passed as a parameter. String get string string key retrieves the string value associated with the key passed as a parameter. Since we've said that the value might not exist, we have a function to check whether a specific key has an association within a pair. bool has key string key returns a boolean indicating whether the key passed as the parameter exists or not. Finally, here are a couple of functions to delete the pairs of values. void delete key string key deletes if it exists the pair with the key specified as the parameter. void delete all erases all the key value pairs, thus erasing all the saved data. There is also a special function that forces the saving of memory. Sometimes you want to force saving to happen before the game is closed, maybe after having saved important data for example. This function can be used for that purpose. void save saves all the key value pairs into the permanent memory. When you think about a save load system, you want to save the variables that describe the player's progress or the game world state. In general, this might not be an easy step. In the case of Retroformer, let's list what we would like to store to save the game. First of all, we may want to store the level, in case we have implemented more than one level, as well as the player's location in the world. Moreover, we want to save the score, and the time elapsed since the game started. This last piece of information is useful for players to understand how long they've been playing the game. Here's an example of saved games that contain the time elapsed taken from Horizon Zero Dawn for PS4. So, let's recap the variables we want to store for our game and associate each one of them to a type. Level. We can store the level either as a string or as an integer. For simplicity's sake, we'll go for the integer. Position. We cannot store this as a single player pref, thus we'll need two key value pairs, one for each axis both of type float. Time elapsed so far. Clearly, this is a float type. Score. This depends on how you implement the score. I'll keep it as an integer. Player's name. This is a string, so we can showcase the use of this type as well. Finally, we need to assign a unique key to each of these values, and then we'll be ready to go. For the association, let's have a look at this table. Let's start building the save load system for our game. In order to integrate the save load system, we need to create a static class that will take care of saving and loading for us. Let's start by creating a new C# -sharp script and name it save load system. Open the script. Here you can remove the inheritance from mono behavior and set it as static class since it will only contain static methods. First of all, we need to create the struct so below the last curly brace, we need to add this struct saving data. A struct is not much different than a class in C-sharp, and this struct doesn't have any methods, just the data fields we've seen in the previous table. Now we can start writing our script. In particular, we need two functions, one to save and another to load. Let's start with the first one. Add the save function. The save function will receive a saving data structure as a parameter as well as the string denoting the save slot. The function goes through all the data in the structure, builds new keys based on the save slot string, and sets all the data within player prefs. At the end, it calls the save function to actually save all the data on the permanent memory. On the other hand, we have the load function. Here it is. It gives back a saving data structure and takes as input the save slot key. As a result, the function is able to query the player prefs with the get functions and store all the data within a newly created saving data structure. At the end, it just returns the structure. If you want to be more sophisticated with your save and load system, then you'll need three more functions. Let's add the first function. The first one checks whether a save slot is available in the memory or not. This is useful when you need to show to the player which slots are empty or which ones are taken. The function is really simple, it just needs to check whether the key passed as a parameter exists. We can do this by checking only one of the data, which we prefixed with the key. In fact, if we do things right, 
we should have incomplete saving slots in which just partial information is available. Another useful function deletes a specific save slot. Let's add it. Deleting a slot can be done by taking in input the key and erasing all the items related to that slot. Here, you need to be sure to erase them all, especially if you don't want to have a problem with the function has slot. Finally, a function that clears all the slots might be useful. Add the code for that. In this case, the only things you save with player prefs are the slots. Therefore, we can easily use delete all, as we're about to do. Otherwise, you need a loop that calls the delete slot function on each of the slots. In our case, the function is just a wrapper for the delete all function. Save the script and congratulate yourself, since you now have a working save and load system.